Hey everybody, Adam Savage from Tested and I am in the Royal Society in London, England and I'm with Virginia. Hello. Hello. And uh, you guys have pulled this out. This yeah. is this is a perpetual motion machine, which we all know is impossible. Virginia, can you tell me what's going on? I can't tell you exactly how it works because <laughs> it's a secret which we keep in a sealed envelope. We've been told not to open. So there's only two people who know the mechanism behind how this works and they work at the University of Nottingham. Um, and they are friends of the creator of the perpetual motion machine. So he's alive? Uh, no, David Jones, who okay. designed the machine, um, passed away in 2017. And he bequeathed his machine and his collections to a fellow of the Royal Society, called Martin Polyakov, who does his own kind of YouTube uh, videos about the periodic table. So people might be familiar with him. Okay. And he donated this to the Royal Society. It's moving now. Is it always moving? It's moving, it's always moving. I don't turn it on or off. I mean, it will eventually, spinning away in our storerooms downstairs, it will start to slow down. And so yeah, then, so every so often we have to send it back to the University of Nottingham where they know the secrets of how to service it and keep it moving. That tells me, I think, what I needed to know. Ah, okay. So, I've inadvertently given away the secret. <laughs> well, so what <laughs> you said is it. that it runs, it, it clearly runs for an extended period of time. Yes, but at it, least two years we've seen it running without intervention. That, yep. that still tracks with what I'm okay. thinking about having looked at this. And then you send it to someone who gives it a bit of a servicing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, my, my first impression, perpetual motion is is impossible, but if it's at all possible, it is a, it's a war of attrition. It is mm -hmm. a battle of tiny, tiny, tiny values. Um, I notice that the primary, that the primary bearings <laughs> that this sits on are encased in acrylic or glass. Uh, and I was wondering why until I asked myself if these three uh, boxes at 120 degrees opposition to each other are not a pile, a battery. Uh, and so if they are some a chemical battery and this thing is insulated, then I move on to these two items of which given my very, very limited unschooled knowledge of electricity, I might imagine that one is an anode and one is a cathode and that there is a way in which uh, Oh, there's a way in which that this could simply be a, a, a charged device moving past a magnet, uh, creating a little bit of impetus um, from the other side, perhaps some type of electrical influence that is allowing these cups to both dispense with and then receive a charge. But then there is this <laughs> other thing, which is this copper pipe, which runs uh, from one side of the wheel down and across the bottom and up to the other. And it is open on both sides, except for a heat shrunk. I'm sorry, a, 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 what do you call it? A, a heat sinked box with a pair of coaxial cable inputs and this extra, there's a valve. There's this piece over here is a valve. And so that leads me to wonder if there isn't some pressurization mm -hmm. or some chemical reaction that allows, that allows a little bit of extra uh, uh, impetus to be imparted through the, through the copper pipe, that it's not just one thing, that it's right. a pair of things yeah. happening in concert. Oh, right. Okay, no, 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 these, these, these two things are magnets. These have to be magnets. That's a popular interpretation, yeah. And so, so when you move a uh, wound, you move iron past a magnet, you get a charge. But so then what do you do with that charge? Hold on. Oh, there's another aspect too, which is this box, the Dredco box that mm. I wrote off as the label first, yeah. has um, a, what looks like a light meter input on both sides. So this makes me also <sighs> wonder if there isn't some um, solar some, some light-based charge going mm -hmm. into this, because this doesn't, well, we don't know that this doesn't go anywhere. No. I mean, I should say when we keep it in storage, it's down in our basement storerooms, which you've seen. And, and when there's no one in there, the lights are all off. The lights are so all off. So it's not got a lot of 
exposure to natural light unless we bring it out to show people like you. But it might not need much. No. Maybe it needs five no, minutes it, every six months. Just the door being opened every now and then. Um, but um, yeah, so Dreadco, which it says here, is, is the uh, name of the company, which was kind of a fake company created by David Jones, who we've got a picture the, that, of here. This is. is David Jones. I mean, he was the writer of a popular science column and he used the pen name Daedalus. And then he wrote um, about these kind of fantastical creations like perpetual motion machines, um, which kind of pushed beyond the boundaries of what was really possible in science. So, and then he, he challenged people to figure out how he got it to work, basically. So if there are elements here that you're not sure they fit into your theory, it's not impossible that those are decoys that he might have been using to distract people. Well, that's where this box come in. There's almost too much going on with it that makes me curious. There's also no way in which these three boxes are in any way electrically con connected to each other because they're all mounted to the same piece of metal. Okay, so I don't think that they're a pile, but we are moving a coil past, potentially a coil past a magnet. So I suspect, I suspect that these are magnets and that they are connected into these two pieces right here. And that these boxes moving through the magnets is allowing a charge to both, is allowing an anode and a cathode to work. That it is effectively a super rudimentary motor deconstructed and split apart. Well, I can't tell you if you're right. <laughs> it's the frustrating thing. Um, but, uh, you know, there are, the people who are in the know tell me that when they eventually found out the secret, they were a bit disappointed. <laughs> they preferred it when it remained an exciting mystery. So then I submit that it's a motor. I submit that it's a motor because that is absolutely how I would feel if someone said <laughs> yeah. it was a motor. I'd be like, I'm yeah. disappointed. We have actually got just over here the, the envelope with you the secret in it. Shall envelope? I show you the envelope? Yes, yeah. So awesome. Here we go. It's, it's a repurposed uh, tax envelope, UK tax office envelope. <laughs> so this is what, so Martin Polyakov, who is the fellow who donated it to the society, he persuaded his friend David Jones to write down the secret before he passed away. And, uh, and David gave him this envelope with the secret in. Unbelievable. Um. Yeah, and I mean, he, he made other designs of perpetual motion machine as well. So this one was made for uh, in the 1980s for uh, the British Association kind of exhibition, which is a big popular science exhibition. Um, and that's when they ran this competition to see if anyone could figure out how it worked. Apparently one person guessed the answer correctly. And he wrote a letter back to them. Uh, David Jones wrote a letter back to them saying he ne would neither confirm nor deny that it was correct. And that's the closest he ever got to giving it away. Huh. Um, but yeah, so th these are a couple of other designs. I don't know if that helps you figure things out, but these are some of his other but we don't know that perpetual. these necessarily we don't know they are... work in the same way on the same basis just with different oh, sort of no, but i still see the same thing i see boxes, boxes moving through yeah. these u-shaped what i would assume would be a mm -hmm. a, 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 a bar a u-shaped yeah. magnet and here again a similar see okay now that i'm <laughs> <laughs> maybe these don't have anything to do with because they're all insulated they're not completing any kind of circuit i think maybe that is also That's i think decoy. that might also be a distraction <laughs> and the light possibly. things coming in might be a distraction yeah. this we did a whole episode on this and it was we got more mail yeah. for that one episode and we actually had a difficulty even in framing the episode because you can't prove a negative sure there's no, there's no percentage in that. Yeah. So we decided to buy some kits that promised over unity. Mm -hmm. And when none of them worked, we said, well, we've given it our best shot. But something tells me this is not the first um, perpetual motion Absolutely machine not. that has arrived at the Royal Society. Absolutely not. So people seem to persist in the opinion that the Royal Society would give a prize to anyone who solved this <laughs> perpetual motion mystery. Impossibility. And is there a prize? There never was. Okay. But people kept writing and writing to the Royal Society well into the 20th century saying, I've solved it. I want a prize. There was no such prize. There was a longitude prize, of course. Um, but yeah, no, no prize if for I perpetual I guys were a little late in paying that one We off. were a bit overdue <laughs> on that bill. You're quite right. Yeah. Um, so I've got an example here, um, which is from the 18th century um, of a debunking of a, a perpetual motion machine. Oh. Um, so this is um, a document written by um, 
John Theophilus de Saguier. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. He was a French Huguenot who came to London. Um, and in, the 17, in 1714, Isaac Newton appointed him as the curator of experiments at the Royal Society. So they had these weekly meetings at the Society and um, he would be responsible for demonstrating things that the fellows had requested or the designs for experiments that he'd come up with. Um, and one of the papers that he presented to them um, was about this, um, so a wheel at Hesse Casal made by um, Orphirius. Um, so Orphirius was a sort of scientific pseudonym, pseudonym for a, a German entrepreneur whose name, real name was uh, Johann Bressel. And he came up with this pseudonym by a cipher where he arranged all the letters of the alphabet in a circle and then used the exact opposite letters to his surname to come up with a pseudonym. So, that he's, so he became known as Orphirius. A coded this, pseudonym. Yeah. I like that. It's cool, right? I, I kind of want to figure out what mine would be now. And yeah, no, I it is. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so he was um, an entrepreneur, a sort of, um, he had various times been an alchemist, a watchmaker, and then he, he came up with these perpetual motion unbalanced wheels and he took them around Europe and royal courts were engaging him and they really believed that he had come up with it. That he'd solved the yeah. problem. Um, but, but yes, so, but de Saguier at the Royal Society explains why um, the uh, so-called um, perpetual motion, um, so it's of late so much talked on and on account of it, its wonderful phenomenon that a great many people have believed um, it to be actually a self-moving engine. So accordingly, he has attempted to... Um, debunk it basically because he's saying a lot of time and money is being spent on this oh, and yeah. it's a waste mm -hmm. of time essentially so yeah he goes on to to outline why um it's not possible that a weighted wheel could continue to move just based on gravity and weights so yeah. people had yeah. reported to him that they could hear weights moving in this wheel um and when um a mathematician did tr um, sort of try to examine it it's great he smashed it he smashed it up he didn't want them looking at it so the debate goes on whether he really believed it or whether he that he created a petrol motion machine or if he knew it was a fraud. Yeah. But he got a lot of people on board and this is but this is um Disagrier's diagrams sort of showing why the weights um and the motion of gravity wouldn't um sort of sustain indefinitely. And this is a very common approach to the mm -hmm. perpetual yeah. motion machine. I've seen many designs along this using gentle curves that reset and it is all about can you get it to want to move at the halfway point and yeah it's just never going to happen. We've got something even earlier actually okay. oh, than really? this 1721. We've got um, a book from 1588 which is actually even before the society existed. But um, fellows very kindly like to sometimes give us books from their collection. They've yeah. done that throughout history. So this was donated, this book from 1588, and it's by um, a book of various and ingenious machines is the title of it, um, although it's in it Italian and French. Um, and yeah, so the engineer who wrote this is uh, Agostino Romelli, uh, an Italian engineer, and it's mostly water wheels. But this one specifically, um, he mentions that the person who commissioned this water wheel from him said that he was concerned that his stream, we can see the stream source of water running at the top, that it wasn't always strong enough to power the wheel. So could he please put a perpetual motion machine device <laughs> in the middle? I don't know why you'd ever need both. If you'd achieved the actual per perpetual motion machine in the middle, you would surely not need the water at all. But um, Oh, and so is this what this we is, see here? He, say, is... he describes it as the inner wheel was designed at the request. Which um, looks very similar to the drawings does, yeah. from a couple hundred years later. A hundred years uh, of this, of the of the same sort of arrangement of gentle curves yeah. around the axis. Wow. Oh, so none of this is part of the perpetual motion. That's just that's the, the water wheel part of it, and then yeah. he's added this addition. Um, so yeah, as I said, it's in French and Italian. So I, I but part of it. Um, I had a rough translation of, and the tone of it to me was as if Romelli, as an engineer, knew that this was. Nonsense. He says, I have included this so that people may include it where it is relevant. You know, I, I think he knew that that was never. <laughs> um, but he wasn't going to be so he, forward as to say it was a lie or that the yeah. gentleman was mistaken. Exactly. Fair enough. Yeah, I think it was a delicate way of saying I took the commission, but really, it's not a perpetual motion machine. <laughs> that is thrilling. This, yeah. this is an amazing group of artifacts because right? this is a, a, a hugely humans are compelled by this idea mm -hmm. i mean every single time i know that when this video goes up there'll be in the comments someone goes what about a generator and a <laughs> motor yeah i mean this machine got a massive response when it was put on display in the 1980s and people were invited to write their letters to david jones or Daedalus, as he called himself 
um, and to try and explain it. Um, so we've got also in the archive all these different suggestions of how it might work. I'm going to um, be making some di. I'm yeah. taking pictures and I'll be making some diagrams. I'll send you what I think. Uh, yeah. I'll send you my actual breakdown of what I think. It's very this. interesting. Yeah, we'll add it to the collection. So oh. you will be in the Royal Society archive, Adam, if you well, would like. <laughs> now it's guaranteed that you're going to get some feverish drawings from okay, me. Okay, great. Jane. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is really thrilling. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk to you.